Good evening. The show is the smoking section, and my name is Stephen Helfer, and you're here with me today. And uh, I hope uh, I am looking at the right camera, but I don't really know which one it is to look at, so I'll kind of look in between them. Uh, but I just returned from New Hampshire, and uh, I was able to buy three cartons of cigarettes up there uh, for a good friend. And these three cigarette cartons that I bought, uh, New Hampshire has a lower uh, state excise tax than Massachusetts. And it also has uh, no sales tax. Uh, so as a result, uh, I was able to buy these cartons of cigarettes for about uh, $74 a carton, which is still grossly uh, too much. It is... Uh, all of the states uh, now are really relying on tobacco revenues and relying on that minority of the citizens who still purchase tobacco like me uh, to basically subsidize uh, non-smokers so that non-smokers' taxes aren't uh, as high as they should be for the services they receive like medical care, roads, police, and fire. Uh, but be that as it may, New Hampshire does not have a sales tax uh, like Massachusetts, which is 6.25%. Uh, so I was able to purchase uh, normally the uh, package of cigarettes in Massachusetts. I think this brand goes for as much as $12. Uh, and I was able to get them for $74. So I just, I'm trying to alert anybody in the uh, Massachusetts Department of Revenue are the Department of uh, Public Health uh, that I am going up to New Hampshire regularly uh, to purchase cigarettes uh, and not pay uh, the sales tax and the predatory excise tax that is levied by Massachusetts. Uh, so if you want me, you know where to find me. Uh, I will be doing this regularly. Uh, today I bought Benson and Hedges. I may buy some other kinds of cigarettes. Uh, but just so we all are got our cards on the table, uh, this is where I'm at. Uh, I think these taxes are predatory, uh, criminal, uh, and they hurt many people. Uh, and I think it behooves me uh, as a moral being, not necessarily a moral being uh, any more moral than anybody else, uh, but as a moral being to act uh, and not to stand by and let this kind of thing happen. Well, uh, today in the New York Times, I saw two uh, pieces about uh, smoking. Uh, one, I was very happy to see a letter to the editor by Ira Glazer, who is a former director of the American Civil Liberties Union, and uh, that the ACLU. And <clears throat> the New York Times, I think it was last Friday, ran a very kind of... Uh, oh, I don't know what you might say, very... Uh, one of the words I can think of is not something, a word I like to use, but a very condescending uh, uh, editorial about the proposed ban of smoking uh, in all public housing everywhere in the United States. Uh, and the, United, the New York Times has been an anti-smoking uh, newspaper well before there is any putative scientific evidence against smoking. Uh, as uh, I have mentioned before, uh, the New York Times in about uh, oh, the late 19th century, late 20th century, late 19th century, uh, said that Spain was declining simply because uh, the Spanish people were using cigarettes. So the New York Times has this uh, kind of uh, endemic uh, antipathy towards tobacco, and I don't know where it really comes from, why uh, this of all papers should go so far back, but still, every editorial in the Times, for the most part, uh, is extremely anti-smoking, anti-smokers. I think it's partly an elitist bias because uh, so many uh, kind of working class people smoke. Uh, but Ira Glazer, again from the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, 
made two points in uh, his letter to the editor today. Uh, one, uh, that uh, the uh, many points the Times made in their editorial uh, were rather dubious, uh, but he said in his letter, setting aside all of those points, the usual second-hand smoke and protecting young people and uh, elderly people from second-hand smoke, uh, he called those dubious, which I think is really great. Uh, but he also said that uh, simply because people are uh, at the uh, kind of at the mercy of the government, it doesn't mean they should be subjected to a social experiment, uh, even maybe scientific experimentation, without uh, their their express permission. And uh, you know, this is something that uh, we see in the federal government when they get people who are. Uh, at their mercy or who are dependent upon them, uh, they want to do all kinds of interventions and this is one of the biggest interventions and uh, it has nothing to do with protecting people from secondhand smoke. This is simply a ploy uh, to basically put these people uh, more uh, on the defensive, having to justify anything they do in their own home and will only be allowed if federal regulators allow them to. Uh, and uh, Bill Cunningham from the Alliance of Cambridge Tenants has been in touch with me um, and he made a very, very good point, I think, uh, because there will be a 60-day, I think, public comment period which I hope people will take advantage of. Um, it's pretty simple to make the public comments. And Bill is of the opinion that all resistance to these kinds of authoritarian regimes really has to be local. Uh, it's not something uh, that, for example, uh, we can address on a national level. It has to be local. We have to convince local people, our city councilors, uh, our public housing authority, our smokers, and our citizens who care about uh, civil liberties, uh, the autonomy of the village, we have to convince them, persuade them, uh, perhaps even educate them as to what this all means, this kind of authoritarianism, this medical authoritarianism, which uh, makes the Constitution simply an actuarial table and if you are uh, doing anything that they don't want you to do, uh, they simply say, well, it's not uh, good for public health. So, uh, and I think that's what Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights has done uh, to the best of our ability, particularly with our city council. Why, uh, I think we have certainly made very, very good points to them which they have heard, and um, I think we can start something in Cambridge. That being said, I do think it is very important to engage in politics at every level. So while I would disagree with Bill to the extent that while we have to work locally and locally is the most important, uh, it doesn't take all that much effort uh, to uh, email the uh, housing and urban development and express your uh, disapproval or perhaps uh, a better way would be to email your U.S. representative and your, uh, your senators, your U.S. senators, uh, which are uh, Elizabeth Warren and Catherine Clark. Uh, I think every bullet political action has consequences. It may not have the consequences that you would like, it may not be able to, you may not prevail, uh, but uh, it may have very small consequences, but those small consequences can matter in the aggregate. Now another article which I thought was rather interesting in the Times uh, is that a Chinese billionaire 
uh, just paid the second highest price uh, for a painting uh, in, in the history uh, in history, and that is a hundred and seventy million dollars for Modigliani, Mod, uh, which is what I think you pronounce pronounce it. Uh, and this uh, person who is a Chinese uh, citizen <clears throat> actually worked his way up from being a cab driver and by making astute financial uh, moves in the 70s and 80s, primarily with the stock market in China, <clears throat> he was able to uh, amass billions of dollars. And there's a very, uh, picture, very good photograph in the Times today of Mr. Liu, <coughs> excuse me, smoking quite, <coughs> quite happily and I think that this is uh, something that um, would be good to see that perhaps his uh, political or his financial acumen uh, may have been helped by the fact that he was a smoker. But nonetheless, um, it's a very good photograph in the Times uh, today, uh, which I hope we will perhaps uh, post on Facebook in the very, very near future. Now. Uh, driving home from uh, New Hampshire today, where I went to buy, uh, among other things, I went to buy cigarettes and bring them across the border uh, to, uh, to avoid the criminal predatory taxes in Massachusetts. Uh, I got into a discussion with a friend of mine about the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, otherwise known as Obamacare. And... Uh, you know, he, he seemed to think that the reason that the Affordable Care Act uh, is written, uh, which will allow insurance companies to charge smokers 50% more for their medical premiums, medical insurance premiums, while if one is an alcoholic, drug addict, diabetic, obese, uh, the insurance companies are not allowed to charge them more. And my friend John, uh, he felt that that was because the insurance companies had lobbied for this. And I think that's very, very unlikely uh, because uh, it's easy. The insurance companies have become a very nice scapegoat for a lot of things. And I think President Obama used them uh, as a scapegoat. But I think this is written into the law by the Obama administration uh, as a way uh, to put further pressure on people who smoke. In this case, to make it difficult for them to get medical insurance. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because for so many years I've heard that the tobacco companies ensnared innocent American victims uh, and then once they ensnared them we we smokers were somehow addicted uh, to a substance that is as addictive as supposedly cocaine and heroin uh, and that we're just all victims uh, and that's what the federal government and that's what the state attorneys general have been maintaining for the last 20 years in their lawsuits against the tobacco companies. But now all of a sudden, and it's very well clear here in the Affordable Care Act, and it's also clear in this uh, housing and urban development uh, proposal to ban smoking in public housing, that now we're being told something completely different. Now we're being told that, oh, hey, you can quit smoking if you want. You're just smoking because you're one of those incorrigible, deviant uh, people who won't do what's good for him and won't do what society is putting all this peer group pressure on. So this is a complete change around. But here we see how the Obama administration is using medical insurance and the deprival or the denial thereof as a cudgel uh, to further uh, convince 
are coerce that minority of the population who want and or choose or are unwilling, if, if, if we're to believe all these uh, state attorneys general and their uh, friends in the trial lawyers, that we are uh, somehow addicted by the tobacco companies. So we can see how duplicitous uh, the whole anti-smoking movement is in so very, very many ways. Um, but uh, certainly in the Obamacare, and this has been noted by a lot of people in the public health profession, uh, who have said, for example, that yes, putting smoking restrictions or re restricting people in places where they can smoke is one thing, but making it difficult for them to work making it difficult for them to find housing, making it difficult for them to get medical insurance or even get medical treatment uh, is something quite different. Uh, and what that is, is a very insidious, pernicious uh, use of force against a minority. And I think what we have to do, Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights, in addition to uh, working here in Cambridge and convincing our city councillors or persuading them or at least softening their stance, making them think a little, uh, just uh, intro which we, I think, did, just introduced a different way of thinking, some different ideas. Uh, we have to work in along those lines. And, uh, you know, the same thing here is going with uh, this proposal in Britain uh, which is uh, to ban smoking on the grounds of all mental institutions. Uh, now, they've already banned it inside, uh, so what people go to mental institutions not necessarily for the same reason they go to a gym or not for the same reason uh, they go uh, exercise or anything like that. They're going there mostly because they're in a very, very difficult crisis, a psychological crisis. So to, to deny them the kind of comfort that tobacco gives them, uh, you know, on the whole campus of the mental institution uh, is totally inappropriate. I mean, uh, the, 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 med the medical profession by their very nature of their profession, supposed to address the needs uh, of the patient. They're not supposed to necessarily reform or uh, create the patient in their image or in the image uh, that the medical profession wants them to be. But in actuality, what I think uh, a lot of this is in Britain now, this proposal to ban smoking on the grounds of hospitals, mental hospitals, is I think they want to discourage smokers from even getting treatment in this regard. So they know that there are many people with medical, uh, mental conditions who smoke who will not come and get the kind of treatment that is supposedly their right. I mean, because most of these people say medical care is a right, not a, not a, a privilege, but a right. They want to discourage them from getting the very treatment they need uh, and and this, this is, again, another cudgel to use in their coercive war on smokers and on smoking. And um, again, again, Bill uh, Cunningham is, makes a very, very good point that the place we can work is locally. So I hope uh, people who are watching our show uh, we'll go to either our Facebook page or our blog and see how they can, you know, email their, uh, their U.S. representatives in the case of this uh, smoking ban in public housing. Or we have a change.org petition uh, that uh, we are promoting and that other people are promoting. And all of these things have effects. They may not have the kind of effects uh, that we would want, but then we don't really want 
uh, no political action is ever going to be easy uh, or convenient. Uh, now, I'm hoping that uh, in the future uh, we will get back uh, Tommy Priester from the uh, from the Boston School, excuse me, Boston School of Herbal Studies, uh, because some of our members have uh, expressed interest uh, in getting some of the blends of tobacco that are organic and that are grown here in Massachusetts. Uh, and grown by individuals. Artisanal tobacco. This is something Plinio de Goyes of the Green Party, uh, who was on the show, mentioned that he would like to see more tobacco production, more local tobacco production. And I myself have been smoking some of this very uh, organic, small batch produced tobacco, and I find it very pleasant. Uh, and in, in addition to that, I think when Tommy Priester comes back, we will talk about different ways, uh, specifics that tobacco can be used for medical purposes. Uh, now, one thing we both talked about on the show was how a poultice of tobacco can very, very quickly stop bleeding. Uh, and one time, uh, I had cut my hand very badly, uh, and I was alone and it would have been very, very difficult to get to a hospital to stop the bleeding. Uh, but using a poultice of tobacco on the cut pretty quickly stopped the bleeding and made it unnecessary for me to get stitches, uh, or certainly unnecessary for me to go to the hospital. So this and many, many other things uh, can be used with tobacco. Um, and in addition to the many things that we've talked about, that just the general pleasure and general comfort that tobacco gives, uh, we are going to try to go over this on the program, uh, maybe even as soon as uh, next, uh, next month. Uh, also, um, other things in the news that uh, I think should, uh, uh, should concern all smokers uh, are just the gradual uh, increase in power of a kind of medical scientific elite that wants to speak and wants to take away uh, the autonomy of people and their right to be heard. And a lot of times, anytime you question them, they will start accusing you of being a denialist. Well, listen, thanks for watching the smoking section. And please tune in next Wednesday at 7 p.m. And uh, we'll wait for you and see you then. Uh, we do hope to have a tax expert next Wednesday uh, to talk about tax 